Chapter 64, Side Story, Karama and Tamamo Once upon a time, a man is walking barefoot through a secluded forest. His dirtied feet step through fallen twigs and over jagged rocks, but he doesn't seem to be bothered by it. The bottom of his gray robes are also somewhat dirty and torn, visibly not being kept in the best of shape. In contrast, his wild orange mane of hair is clean and shiny and tied up in a ponytail. If it wasn't, it may just reach his feet. He takes the time to stop and appreciate the sounds of the woodland beings around. The chirping of birds, the squeaking of squirrels, and the noticeable wails of a deer making her way directly toward him, where she stops right in front of him and bumps her head on his chest. He pats her on the neck with his clawed hand, nails long and sharpened to an unnatural degree, but the deer doesn't seem intimidated by it at all. She steps back and motions him to follow, which he does. After a few minutes of walking, he hears humming. A very melodic angelic humming that somehow puts his mind at ease. He wasn't even aware that his mind needed to be put at ease. It feels nostalgic even though he's never heard it before, and homely even though he doesn't really have a home. When the deer leads him to the source of this voice, he finds himself standing in front of a small creek flowing through the woods and the woman humming the song. He can only see her back, and even then, most of it is taken up by long flowing silky black hair. She's sitting on the muddy ground in her pure white robes, undoubtedly getting them much dirtier than she's probably even gotten them before. But the oddest thing is the young fawn lying on the ground next to her and an elk standing guard over them. The fawn has an injured leg that she's currently treating, washing away the blood with water from the creek and wrapping it in long thick blades of grass. The man approaches curiously, once she's done singing. What are you doing? She doesn't turn around, choosing to focus on the fawn. I'm tending to this young one, of course. Her voice is calm and serene. He looks over the bite marks. Why? The wolves were unable to get it this time, but they will eventually. Then it's lucky I was here to heal it. You've no reason to. His voice isn't mocking or condescending in any way, but he can't seem to comprehend why someone would do it. I saw an injured child, and I have the ability to heal it. That's all the reason I need. And in that way, you're depriving the wolf cubs of a meal. One child is starving because you saved a different one. You're not its mother, just leave it. Then I will become this forest's mother. Be it a fawn or a cub, I'll tend to their every need. Then there won't be any issues with me healing them. The man scoffs. That's a ridiculous sentiment. Perhaps. The tone of her voice shifts, becoming more somber. Even though he's yet to see her face, he can hear her smile drop. But it's my own ridiculous sentiment and no one can take that from me. The man looks her over with a quizzical look before drawing closer, along with the deer. What's your name, weird one? It's then that she turns around and they meet for the first time. She's the pinnacle of beauty, with her smooth snow-white skin and dark eyes. Her soft features are highlighted by her kind smile, which has now returned to her for the benefit of her mysterious companion. Even her simplest movement is clearly calculated and trained, exhibiting the telltale signs of someone whose head etiquette drilled into them. She's most certainly not a peasant woman. He, on the other hand, is the very definition of monstrous. His gray robes are filthy, torn, and loose, and he's resting a clawed hand on his open robe, rather than in the sleeve. His orange-maned hair frames a face that would normally drive even a loving mother away. Sharp fangs clearly visible every time his mouth is even slightly agape, whisker markings on each cheek, and vertically slit blood-red eyes, all of that unaided by an ever-present scowl. To Mamo, and yours? He stares at her with his piercing red eyes for a few moments before responding. Karama. I see. Tamamo smiles. Such a beautiful name. She turns around to give her attention to the injured fawn. Karama cocks his head and raises a brow. You're not afraid of me? What reason would I have to be? She asks nonchalantly. A reason? He snorts in amusement. You've eyes, don't you? I do. She nods. And with these eyes of mine I see a concerned mother who guided you to her injured child. I see a territorial father who does not mind your presence in his territory. So if they trust you, what reason would I have to be scared? You truly are an odd one. Perhaps. She chuckles. What brings you to these lands, if I may ask? I know for certain you're not from town, and you don't appear to be a traveler. Are you a hermit? Hmm. I suppose you could say that. I. He lets out a low growl. Don't get along with city folk. What of you? Why does a well-dressed lady sit in the mud? In certain ways. I do not get along with city folk, either. I come here to calm my emotions and enjoy a serene atmosphere. The animals here are so pure, untainted by greed they live their lives in earnest, without deceiving each other. It's truly a beautiful world they live in. A self-aware human. How interesting. 
Tamamo glances at him from the corner of his eyes, curious about his odd choice of words, but does not bring it up. Just as Karama intends to ask her what the questioning gaze is for, he senses something in the distance. People approaching at high speeds. They're either chasing or hunting to be traveling at such a pace. Tamamo carefully aids the fawn back to its feet and ushers them to go. You should leave. She addresses Karama despite still looking toward the deer to make sure they're well. People are coming for me and. As she turns around, she finds herself entirely alone, her companion nowhere in sight. Not even with her sensing can she feel his presence. So he does have chakra. Given his appearance, could he be an Inuzuka or a Tenro? She muses to herself. She stands up to her feet and brushes off her kimono, although there's little she can currently do for it. It'll probably take multiple washings to get it back to how it should look. Just then, five figures clad in dark attire appear kneeling in front of her. Lady Atsutsuki, your father has been worried sick. One of them addresses her. He demands your return at once. Another adds. Tamamo sighs and walks forward. Yes, I'm certain he does. As she approaches them, her form flickers away, followed shortly by the five figures. From the nearby trees, Karama observed the interaction. Not wanting to stray too far in case something bad was to happen, he hid and kept an eye. Atsutsuki, huh, so she's Hagoromo's descendant. Probably from Asura, doesn't have Indra's crazy look in her eyes. He leans back against the trunk of the tree, looking up to the clouds in contemplation. How long's it even been, old man? Tamamo walks down the winding corridors of her family estate, long halls that cover an area much larger than anyone would ever possibly need, yet the need to flaunt overtakes common sense. Every time she walks these hollow halls, she feels the urge to run back to the forests where things are simpler. Ahead and behind her are the same people from before, escorting her back as they always do to her father. They kneel in front of the sliding door and open it, allowing Tamamo to enter on her own. Inside, an elderly man jumps from his seat, almost knocking over his glass on the table, and runs over to Tamamo. You've returned. He runs his hands over the muddy spots on her kimono. You've been to the forests again? Why do you insist on going there? It's merely a stroll, father. No ill shall befall me. She reassures him. You must take care of yourself, now more than ever. I received word from Ryazan, he's to arrive in a month's time to discuss your marriage. Tamamo does her best to force a smile for her father. That's excellent news, she says in a strained voice. You remember Ryazan, yes? He asks, oblivious to his daughter's distress. He's become a renowned merchant, but his skills in Ninchu are nothing to scoff at, as well. We met only once when we were very young, I don't recall much of that time. HRM, yes, well, I'm certain it'll come back when you see him again. You may leave, I must rest for the night. He begins walking back to his bed before stopping in his tracks to turn to her once more. And, Tamamo, do stop these visits to the woods. Ryazan wouldn't accept a wife to runs off to play in the mud. No, I'm certain he wouldn't. She says with her back turned to him, continuing to leave through the door. Tamamo returns to her room, spending most of the night staring out the window, wondering why her fate is to be tied to someone else, just for a bit of power and money that her family will gain from it. Once, other clans fought each other for the honor of joining with the Atsutsuki, but now, her father has gotten older and to preserve what little he has, he's arranged for his only child to marry into a merchant family. This branch of the once great clan has already deteriorated, just barely holding itself up. The only solace she now has is her walks to the forest. The days to come pass in the usual somewhat tense atmosphere for this household, of Tamamo regularly venturing into the woods, eventually being hunted down by her father's guards, and being reprimanded once she returns. However, she will allow for none of that to bring her spirit down, she'll hang on to the thing that brings her the most peace. It's not always that she runs into Karama, but it's certainly become a highlight of her days. It's finally something different that brings life to her trips, a break from the monotony that consumes her life. A secret rendezvous in the woods that no one knows about. Her little secret. Then again, it's not always that she's able to greet him with a smile. On one particular day, she unfortunately finds a bear cub lying in the dirt. Unmoving. Tears clouding her eyes, she removes the arrows from the cub and lays them to the side. She cleans the wounds despite knowing full well it's a futile effort, but it brings her some small semblance of comfort. Looks like you were too late this time. Karama's voice says hidden from the woods before he steps out. I'm aware. She says in a cold tone. And yet you still try. He sits on a rock not far from her, observing her actions. Could we please not? My mood has been sour as of late. He raises his arms and leans back. Very well. 
They stay in silence for a bit, Tamamo sitting on the ground in a pool of blood. No doubt she'll be lectured once again for not keeping herself clean. Karama notes that there's much more that a single injured cub would have. They most likely killed the mother bear and left the cub out in the woods. Do you have family, Karama? She finally asks, still yet to lift her head from the bear. Hmm. I suppose you could say that. Closest I have to one, anyway. Are you close? He snorts, amused by the very thought. Not really, no. We have. Differences in opinion. So we don't really spend much time together. That means you're free to wander and meet new people, then. Have a choice as to who is in your life and who isn't. It must be nice. In a way. It's not for everyone, though. You've your own path, don't you? Of tending to this forest's children. He reminds her. Yes, in a way you're correct. She finally shows a smile. So long as I'm alive, I won't let any harm befall these children. It's a difficult task what you're promising to do. He warns. It is. However, I've chosen this to be my family. I and no one else. I hope you can one day find people to call family, as well, Karama. I doubt that will ever happen. The days to follow go by in a rather similar way. Tamamo continues her regular visits to the woods, despite her father's warnings, and Karama is sometimes around. She spends her days in ways that he finds utterly pointless. Finding branches for the birds to use in their nests, helping squirrels find nuts, gathering mushrooms and berries, some of which she leaves for the local animals that eat them. He'd tell her how pointless it all is, and that she's probably doing more harm by doing that, but her joyful demeanor and smile overpower his grumpiness. If that's what she wants to do, then so be it. She seems to be taking her self-imposed role of forest mother quite seriously. The animals even begin openly warming up to her and visiting her much more often. It's a strange gift she has, for sure. For the most part, they spend their time together in silence when they do meet. Tamamo tends to ask a lot of questions that he has no answer for so he remains as vague as he can be. He tries to distract from his lack of backstory with his own question, getting to know more about this girl. She's nowhere near as powerful as Hagoromo Atsutsuki ever was, but being his descendant, she seems to have inherited some of his power. The strength of her chakra is definitely nothing to scoff at. Seems like she's been forced to lead a secluded life by her father. If she was allowed to travel, she'd definitely be a name to remember. Right now, however, the poor girl is left with little choice. Truly a pitiable existence. Being free by all accounts but still trapped in a prison. He laments the girl's existence. On the fateful day when she's to meet her betrothed, Tamamo sits in her room and waits patiently, as she was told to do. In truth, their particular branch of the mighty Atsutsuki name has dwindled quite a bit. Her father had her at a late age and does not have any other children besides her. So it all rests on her shoulders. This arranged marriage will essentially end the Atsutsuki name, but the lands they own will be secure for a bit longer and won't fall to ruin as they normally would. A part of her knew it would end up like this. She knew freedom is a luxury she couldn't afford, but she's had so many other luxuries that complaining wasn't always an option. For the sake of the people under their care, this is what she must do. The person she's set to marry is someone she met as children, so it's not like she can use those memories to judge. There are stories about him, as there always are. Some call him a womanizer, while others say he doesn't even look at other women, some say he does not nothing but lay around and party, while others say he does nothing but work, so no one sees him. As far as information goes, she's found everything to be useless, nothing solid. That only serves to annoy her even more. It's one thing to be wed to a stranger, but another to not even have any intel on him. Still, she patiently waits. He's set to arrive by ship along with a sizable entourage, no doubt to show his wealth and influence. Showing off is a big part of their lifestyle, after all. She waits well into the afternoon, when they should have arrived long ago. No doubt negotiating with the master of the house. She sighs and stands up from her bed, tired of sitting, and moves toward the window. Maybe some fresh air will help. When she does, however, her eyes catch a glimpse of fingers on her windows. The grunting and sliding of riles follow, before a man slowly climbs up the windows. Finely dressed with short light brown hair, he smiles widely when he sees. Good afternoon, my lady. She immediately flickers to the window, hand raised forward and already covered in flames. Fire release? Fire wave, a cone of fire emanated from her palm aimed right at the peeping Tom. When the fire dies down, she looks around to find his charred remains, but none are to be seen. Please accept my apology. Her head snaps to the voice coming from next to the window, the man now clinging to the walls with his chakra. I meant no offense, I was simply captivated by the aura of beauty that emanated from your room. 
You've a fancy way of calling yourself a pervert, pervert. She leaps out the window after him. He flickers off to the roof and runs away, laughing as he does. The nerve. She grits her teeth in frustration. Tamamo's body becomes surrounded in a light coat of chakra, her black hair gradually turning into a lighter shade of red. Adamantine attack, Lady Tamamo. Someone knocks at the door. Lord Atsutsuki requests your presence. She halts her chase of the pervert, hair turning black once more. Coming, she calls out and returns to her room, opening the door as if nothing had just happened. The servant leads her to the main meeting room where her father and husband-to-be are waiting. The door is open for her and she's introduced to those present. Lady Tamamo Atsutsuki has arrived. The servants shuffle back as Tamamo enters, taking in the familiar scenery. Her father sitting in the largest chair, surrounded by his trusted advisors and a small group of people she's not seen before. With one exception. Her eyes widen at the sight of a familiar man, the very same man who only a minute ago climbed her window. But, surely it couldn't be him. If he was present at this meeting, he couldn't also have been with her. Tamamo, her father addresses her, greet your future husband. This is Lord Ryo. The elderly man pauses when the person he was just introducing stands up, chair skidding on the floor behind. It is a pleasure and an honor to meet you, Lady Tamamo Atsutsuki. He walks around the table to approach her. The rumors of your beauty and grace do you no justice, I'm ashamed to admit. He bows deeply but still looks up to her with a mischievous smirk. Tamamo bows back. His expression. It was definitely him just now. But how could he have pulled it off? Ryazan Yuzumaki, he introduces himself. At your complete disposal. It is an honor, as well, Lord Ryazan. I'm sure you've much knowledge to share. She looks at him with an accusatory glance that only they would understand. I shall gladly share anything the lady requests. Ryazan then turns to the head of the Atsutsuki branch. With your permission, Lord Atsutsuki, may I speak to Lady Tamamo in private? If we're to be wed, I believe it only prudent to speak to each other. Of course. The man nods. Tamamo, lead Lord Ryazan to the seer's chamber. You shall display your abilities to the Uzumaki. Yes, father. She bows. Like a performing animal. Ryazan and Tamamo walk outside into the estate's vast garden. She wastes no time in breaking away from him and glaring. I hadn't expected you to be a voyeur, Ryazan Uzumaki. I am not. He looks at her with a shocked expression. That would imply that I watched you in private, which I did not. I merely climbed your window and tried to enter your room. And you tried to kill me before I could even introduce myself. As any sane person would. You'd be surprised. He mutters to himself. Either way, I'm pleased you reacted the way you did. You're pleased I tried to burn you alive? She raises a brow. I am. Otherwise I'd have called off the engagement. He says with a smile. Tamamo looks even more confused at this odd, odd man. Are your faculties all in order? Ryazin laughs. I don't believe so, no. This man is so. Tamamo curses her fate. I'm pleased that the rumors of you turned out to be false. He grins. Many say you're a wallflower, but a wallflower doesn't immediately resort to murder. Self-defense. She corrects him. So is that your criteria to marry into the Uzumaki family? One must fight their way in? Were it up to me, yes. Does the Atsutsuki not value strength of character? I'd have assumed so. If you've gotten to this point then you must know of our situation, Lord Ryazan. Surely you know of our branch's dwindling power, it's not precisely a secret. We can't afford to be as picky. Rimzin lets out a burst of laughter. Ah, some honesty. I've been craving that for quite a while. Still, your abilities are sought after by many throughout the lands. You could be as picky as you wish. My clairvoyance is fairly exaggerated, it's nowhere near as powerful as some believe, although it has saved us on several occasions. It offers vague flashes of possibilities that are often difficult to interpret, and I'm incredibly exhausted once it's complete and after that. Any other attempts for a while are incredibly foggy. So I've been made aware. I'm increasingly curious to get to know you, Tamamo Atsutsuki. She finally leads him into the chamber where she can use her jutsu, a special room dedicated just for this, lined with jutsu formulae that aid in the casting. Out front, her father and everyone else have already gathered and are waiting. Now, Tamamo, demonstrate to Lord Ryazan the full extent of your capabilities. Yes, father. She enters and sits down in the middle of the room, at the center of the jutsu formulae that cover the entire room. This is what she's become famous for throughout the land. Her selling point as some would put it. The reason she's had hundreds of admirers her entire life, although they more admire her power and influence than anything else. Clairvoyance. The ability to peer into the near future for even a brief moment. It's not an exact skill and its workings mystify even the most knowledgeable practitioners of Ninshu. 
By all accounts, an ability like this should not exist, and yet here it is. It's typically utilized to see how the land will prosper, if there will be any ills that plague the land, such as bad harvests or other forms of destruction. Enemy invasions have also been predicted thanks to Tamamo's clairvoyance. Everyone stays back to allow her enough room to display her abilities, with Ryazin looking at her with an intense gaze, growing every curious about his future wife. Tamamo weaves the hand signs for her jutsu. It's a slow and methodical process, taking her well over a minute to go through what feels like a hundred hand signs. Every move is practiced to mold her chakra as best as she can to give the best results of her visions. When she finishes, the formulae around her glows, the whole room becoming illuminated. She opens her eyes to reveal they, too, are glowing. Images flash through her mind. Ruin. People screaming. Destruction. Homes being torn. Flood. A giant turtle emerging from the water, ripping into the ground with its claws. The kappa screeches. Tamamo jumps up to her feet, panting and already sweating profusely. We need to evacuate the docks. Now. Before Ryazin can even wonder what's going on, the Atsutsuki head turns to his guards. Get everyone you have available on it. Mind not to cause panic. Yes sir. The guards immediately spring into action. Tamamo moves to leave the room, followed by her father and a very confused Ryazin. What did you see, Tamamo? The head asks. The kappa. It will attack us soon. She answers concisely. A great beast, here? Ryazin curses under his breath. Today of all days. It would appear your arrival is ill-timed, Lord Ryazin. Tamamo addresses him while moving forward with purpose. I advise you to take shelter with your men. I will do no such thing. What of you? Did your clairvoyance not leave you weakened? Should you not take shelter, as well? I cannot afford to. I must protect my people. She states with conviction. Out in the forest, Karama sits under a tree as he usually does to pass the time. It's uneventful as usual and boring as usual. He's beginning to wonder what he's even doing sticking around here instead of going out in the wide world to roam freely. No he's not truly wondering that. He knows exactly what he's doing here, sheer curiosity in wanting to see how the old man's descendant turned out. She's clearly someone in pain, someone who wants to shout out against the world, but can't or just doesn't want to stir the pot by doing it. Karama has watched humans misuse Ninshu for decades now and has been close to giving up on them. Hagormo's wish to watch over them and guide them. It's not possible. Just as he mentally prepares himself to go and find something to amuse himself with to get rid of these thoughts, he receives a mental summons. Karama finds himself sitting not in a forest but a blank space, still in his humanoid form. Looking ahead, he's met not by a river, but a monstrous three-tailed turtle, shell broken and cracked, skin torn and bloodied. Asoba wheezes, trying to get his breath. Karama? Is that you? He looks around his surroundings through squinting eyes. Well, well. Karama chuckles. What happened to you? Get caught in a fishing net? Fuck you. Asobu growls at his joke. Karama, listen to me. The damn kappa is heading north to the Kiku Seas. If you're close enough to sense me, that means you're close, right? You have to stop it. Karama stares at him for a moment before bursting into a fit of laughter. Stop the kappa? Why would I go out of my way to do something so pointless? If it wants to rampage, then let it. Unlike you, I don't envy it for walking on two legs, I've no reason to fight it. Asobu slams his leg on the ground. This isn't funny. That thing's already destroyed several human settlements, and it'll keep destroying if left to its own devices. Saving humans isn't something that interests me anymore. Karama stands up to his legs, dusting his kimono of dirt that had gathered while he was sitting in the forest, and walks up to Asobu's much larger form, staring him directly in the eye. It's a waste of time, dear brother. You say that. And yet you keep taking a human form. Asobu notes Karama's current appearance. It's exactly because I take this form that I know better than any of you that these humans are a lost cause. The old man was wrong. Accept it. Kura, before Asobu can protest any further, Karama severs the mental link they share. He finds himself back in the peaceful forest, looking over a calming river. Karama clicks his tongue. Putting me in a bad mood. If you can't finish a fight, then don't start it, you damn turtle. He stands up and dusts himself off. If the kappa is around then it's time for me to go further north. I have nothing to prove by fighting it. Just as he looks to the horizon to plot his next course, something clicks. He looks southward to the sea and the nearby town that rests by it. Hold on, isn't Kiku the human name for this sea? If it's coming here, then. Despite his own conviction and the harsh words he just threw at Asobu, Karama runs south to the sea. 
All the years he'd spent living among humans and seeing how they've been changing, be it for better or worse, he thought those were enough to seal his opinion of the humans. Yet, there's one girl who keeps appearing in his mind. Among all the humans who have let him down, humans who spit on everything Hagormo tried to build, one girl is enough to force him to act. He growls. Guess your spirit isn't gone just yet, old man. The town continues to be in a state of panic, with everyone from the Atsutsuki estate getting the town folk to rush into evacuating. People are given barely enough to take even the most basic supplies, and the lack of time to give a proper explanation does not aid much. However, much to Ryazan's and the rest of the Uzumaki merchants' entourages, surprise, the people seem to immediately change their tune once they're told these simple words by Lady Tamamo's word. Upon hearing that this is all happening on Tamamo's orders, not only do the people stop complaining, but they pick up the pace as if they weren't caught by complete surprise. By the shoreline, several of the Atsutsuki's elite stand at set intervals, positioning themselves at the perfect distance to defend their own. They each go through the same hand signs. Barrier. Warding formation. Large plates of chakra emanate from each other, towering over even the largest building in town. The plates expand in size until they meet another one, at which point they stop expanding and fuse together. Atop one of the rooftops, Tamamo stands watch facing the sea, with Ryazan kneeling by her side looking over the evacuation. You best join your men, Lord Ryazan. The attack is imminent. Tamamo warns. What attack? He asks, still in the dark. Did you see something with your clairvoyance? I did. She nods. The kappa will be upon us soon, so please, evacuate with everyone else. He stands up to his feet with a more steeled expression. You think me a person who would abandon his wife in a time of peril? If a great beast aims to destroy your home, then I will defend it with you. Tamamo looks at him from the corner of her eye. You owe this town nothing. You owe me nothing. There are more suitable wives for you, Lord Ryazan. None, however, who would stand unfazed knowing that a great beast will attack. He remains in place. Or is my presence that much of a bother? I would never insinuate something like that. She adds with a smirk. The water surface breaks. The waves rise, flooding the entirety of the docks. A beaked head emerges from under the water and lets out a screech that can be heard by everyone in the area, sending a shiver down their spine. A predator has come for its prey. The kappa runs for the barrier and sinks its claws into it. It holds for only a second before a crack appears in the plate it's attacking. It's not going to hold. Ryazan observes, preparing himself to go on the offensive. The Justu is yet to finish. Tamamo does not panic. The guards in charge of the surrounding plates begin to move. The barriers close in on the kappa with the goal of crushing it with sheer force. A strategy that may work on smaller and weaker enemies, but the kappa pushes back even when pressured from three sides. It's not going to hold. Tamamo confirms Ryazan's initial fear. She flickers to the rooftops closer to the docks. Chakra surrounds her entire body to the point of her hair and clothes billowing as if caught in a great storm. Her hair gradually goes from obsidian black or blood red as spectral chains fly out toward the monster. Adamantine sealing chains, they latch onto the monster, wrapping around its whole body. The pain only causes it to screech louder as it's held in place. Ryazan, in turn, flickers all the way to the barrier itself, coming face to face with the walking disaster. He slams his hand against a cracked barrier, jutsu formulae spreading from his palm, and snaking their way across the kappa's body in a spiral pattern. Whirling tide seal, the kappa's body seems to be dragged inward, its body pulled along with the jutsu formulae that move toward the central point of the seal. Like a ship pulled to the center of a whirlpool. Using her chains, Tamamo tries to aid in the process. The kappa, however, fights back. Everyone focuses their chakra as much as they possibly can to strengthen the power of their barriers and seals. Seeing that its body can't move, the kappa instead opts for an elemental attack. A sphere of water gathers at the tip of its beak, spinning violently as it gathers in place. Once it's finished, it fires the street of water at the barrier, shattering the plates instantly. Ryazan is flung back from the sheer force of it. Ryazan, Tamamo calls out to him but she's not allowed much time to worry for others. The kappa shoots the beam of water throughout the village, destroying several houses, one of which being the house Tamamo was on. She tries to avoid the destruction, but the crumbling houses make it difficult. In the end she finds a spot to land safely among some wreckage. If she hadn't foreseen this attack, the amount of people who would have died is staggering. However, that's still not out of the question. The evacuation is not complete, people are still within the town. She focuses her adamantine chains once more, this time to create a defensive barrier. 
If it tries to shoot its water again, it might be enough to halt it for a bit. Ryazan appears by her side, having evaded a fatal blow, although his right arm looks bad. I've never actually sealed anything larger than a bear before. He tries to jest despite his pain. I'm afraid my own abilities are limited. I may have a solution for that. A way to bolster both of our abilities. Tamamo reluctantly says. How quickly can it be done? Ryazan asks. The kappa charges another sphere of destructive water, this one much bigger than the one it used before. Now, it actually has the time to display its full power. Not quickly enough. Tamamo answers grimly. The kappa points its beak to the city, the sphere having compressed itself as much as it can. However, before it can shoot it at the town, a sphere of dark chakra blasts it in the chest, causing the water to shoot up in the air as the kappa stumbles back. Then several more fire at it, some missing, some hitting their target. Continuous tailed beast bombs. Much to Tamamo and Ryazan's complete shock, a monstrous nine tailed fox jumps over them and sinks its fangs and claws right into the kappa. Karama roars and drags the kappa down to the ground, holding its head down with a claw. That's a tailed beast? On top of a great beast, we have to deal with this as well. Ryazan grits his teeth. Tamamo stares blankly at the two monsters fighting. But how? My clairvoyance only showed me the kappa, not the nine tails. Was my vision clouded by something? Either way, this might provide us the chance we need. Ryazan reminds her. You said you might have a way to turn the tides of this battle? We can use their territorial dispute to gather our bearings. Indeed. Tamamo brings her hands together, focusing her chakra. Meanwhile, Kappa manages to knock the nine tails off his balance, scratching away at his fur and leaving a massive gash on his leg. Karama tries to keep on the kappa, but its control of water allows it to get back up quickly, slamming the fox's head into the docks, destroying even more buildings. Karama uses his tails to grab onto it and hold it in place, but with a single flick of its wrist, the kappa controls the water around it to drown the nine-tailed fox. Damn it, I have to take the fight somewhere else. If we stay in the water, I'm done for. If we stay here, the town's done for. While the turtle-like creature has the terrain advantage, Karama has the physical advantage. Even if his body is being pelted by water, he still has nine whole tails to use in a fight, hitting its body and restraining it where he can't stop it from controlling any more water. Once the water stops, Karama sinks his teeth into its shoulder, but the kappa returns the favor by sinking its beak into his shoulder. The two start trying to push each other backward. Kappa trying to push Karama further into the water, and Karama trying to push it onto land away from the town. Their constant struggle in trying to push each other back causes the waves to grow ever irregular, flooding more and more of the town. I might be able to pin it down with my tails, but how much destruction would that cause? He tries to keep his jaw clenched around its shoulder despite the pain he's also in. Then again, how much destruction will they cause if I don't? And I'm doing this for what, one child who vaguely reminds me of the old man? Damn it all. They both release each other at the same push and try to push away. Kappa once again gathers water at the tip of its beak, but Karama is quick to react. Gather his own dark chakra, much smaller and condensed than his usual technique, this one is made firing off quicker in times of emergency. Tailed beast bullet, less destructive than the bomb, but just as capable of getting the job done. Kappa stumbles further back into the sea, but it doesn't waste any time. Screeching mad, it gathers water around itself, the wave rising as tall as the beasts themselves. You're getting really annoying, you oversized turtle. Karama bellows out. He gathers all of his nine tails firmly around his body and swings them as hard as he can. The resulting gust clashes with the waves, pushing them back. It's not as strong as it could have been as that would have sent wind in all directions rather than just ahead of him. The town would have been destroyed too, but it does the job for now. All he can really do is push it back and play on the defensive. Meanwhile, back in the town, Tamamo stares at the nine-tailed beast in disbelief. That voice. She mumbles to herself. Ryazan curses as he watches the bout. Such immense power. Can your plan match up to that? I definitely hope so. Tamamo continues to weave her chakra. It's not a technique I use lightly, it's in the spirit of our great ancestor's will. The sharing of chakra and bonding is one, Ninshu. You will feel an odd sensation, you will feel your strength welling up, but I ask that you put your faith in me. I already have. He says without hesitation. She nods to him. Then let us protect everyone. Adamantine linking chains, a rounded and smooth chain, in contrast to the spiked one she used previously, materializes from her body. Rather than attacking their foe or defending themselves, this chain goes straight through Ryazan's body. As it does, he falls to his knees as an overwhelming surge of information hits him. 
he can feel foreign knowledge, foreign thoughts come to mind, events he's never experienced, things he's never seen or done. It doesn't take long to realize that these fragments are from Tamamo's mind. He sees her kindness, he feels the love she has for others, the kind nature that has made her beloved by all around. Everyone always speaks of Tamamo Atsutsuki's beauty and her powerful use of chakra, but barely anyone mentions the sight of her. Glancing over, he sees her going through a similar sensation, although her reaction is not as extreme as his, coming from having experienced all of this before. She also sees Ryazan's thoughts and life, seeing his stern but gentle demeanor, his drive to become a better person, to succeed and spread joy to others. She also feels herself slightly invigorated, now that they share chakra, she feels some of her strength returning. She's never experienced a connection this deep or this powerful with anyone else. Ryazan Uzumaki seems to be cut from different cloth than others she's met. We must act. Tamamo says but Ryazan repeats her every word the moment she speaks it. Wah. What just happened? He asks and again, she repeats his words. Do not fear. Once more, they speak in unison. We are one now, as long as this chain connects us, a connection that transcends everything we know in life. Everything I can do, you can do and everything you can do, I can do. He knows this to be true now. Years of training that he doesn't recall undergoing flow through his mind, he knows things he never thought possible. She reaches out to him and caresses his hair, taking in a strand between his fingers. He can now see that his usual light brown hair has turned red, just like hers whenever she summons her chains. I've yet to see anyone's hair change color as mine does. You're a curious individual, Ryazan Uzumaki. She smiles to him. Watching her elegant form stand over him, Ryazan finds it difficult to resist acting. He stands up to his feet and takes Tamamo in his arms, kissing her. Or did she take him in her arms? Their shared thoughts make it difficult to distinguish who exactly initiated this to happen, but it's certain that neither of them resisted. We must go. Tamamo says when they part. Yes, of course. I apologize. Ryazan looks at her in confusion, visibly overwhelmed. They both take off at the same time, flickering toward the beasts who continue to slash away at each other in the seas. Ryazan knows exactly where Tamamo wants to go, what she plans on doing, and he even knows his own role to play. There's also another thought that runs through his mind. The decision to only subdue the great beast, and not the tailed beast. The Nine Tails' actions. It certainly seems like it's defending the town because it's very visibly holding back and pushing the kappa away. The question now is, why? Tamamo and Ryazan land in the water not far from the two monsters, keeping themselves afloat with chakra. Both of them perform the same hand signs at the same time. Adamantine sealing chains, they both release the strength of Tamamo's chakra onto the kappa, holding onto it with greater success than before. The chains seemingly sink into its skin and shell, taking hold of its very soul. The chain spins around in a spiral as they latch on. The two then go through another set of hand signs. Whirling tide seal, formulae spread across the chains and flow into the kappa, covering its whole body. Just as before, it seems like the seal pulls its body into a single point, trying to crush it into a single point. However, it's still fighting back and not giving them the chance to take an easy win. Then how about this? Ryazan lets Tamamo control the seals while he goes through another jutsu. Electricity begins sparking from his hands, growing more intense as he forms more hand signs. At the end, he grabs onto the chains, sending it coursing toward the giant turtle-like creature. Lightning release? Lightning current, Karama jumps back to land, seeing the electricity on its way to its target. Any resistance that Kappa gives comes to a stop the moment it's electrocuted by Ryazan, its body loosening and unable to give any more resistance. Ha! Way to go, kid! Karama gives a toothy smirk. But even that little seal of yours won't be enough to completely crush it. He begins Charing's another tailed beast bomb, this time set to finish the fight once and for all. However, he finds himself unable to finish it when multiple translucent plates surround him from every direction. Barrier. Warding formation, Karama growls. Forgot about these Smalfree. This time, more of them have gathered to strengthen the barrier and apply much more pressure than they could before. They stack as many Jutsu as they can to crush him. Tamamo, on seeing the Nine Tails getting overwhelmed, rushes to him. No, she releases the linking chains that connect her and Ryazan, leaving the man to fall to the ground from the whiplash. Tamamo? He tries to regain his senses, reeling in from a violent flash of Tamamo's emotions, just before she severed the link. He saw flashes of a forest, of wildlife, and of a beast of a person. The kappa is released and it uses this opportunity to slowly sink away to the depths. Tamamo summons her chains to lash out at the barrier, breaking it from the outside when she disrupts the Atsutsuki's guard's focus. 
With the nine tails freed, she uses her chains to lift herself up to be eye level with him. Run, Karama, she whispers to him. His eyes widen in surprise that she recognized him, but doesn't have time to question it. Karama makes a dash for it, running back into the woods, with Tamamo following not far behind him. Lady Tamamo? The men stare in disbelief. She helped it? Why? Another one falls to her knees. We have to find her. The third one acts, not letting himself relax. Still out at sea, Ryazan flickers to the woods as well. Deeper into the woods, Karama reverts back into his humanoid form, trusting it'll be much more difficult to track than a giant fox that towers over the entire forest. He makes his way to the familiar river that he spent most of his days by, slowing down when he senses a very familiar chakra drawing closer to him, seemingly knowing exactly where he's headed. It doesn't take long for Tamamo to land behind him. She takes a tentative step toward him. He addresses her without looking back. You ought to return, kid. Not safe to be around me right now. She does not heed his advice. You were. A tailed beast this whole time? Why did you not say so? Because there's no purpose in revealing who I am. I stay back and observe, that's my role. He answers plainly, but there's so much I want to ask you. She takes another step toward him. We've lost so much since the days of our great ancestor, we barely know anything about you. People have begun to weave their own tales, regardless of whether they're true or not. That's fine. He says, walking into the forest. Stories are fine. Us and you. If there's anything I've learned these past hundred years, it's that we don't mix well. It's better this way. But, before she can protest any further, a third figure arrives on the scene, his hair still a vibrant red. Where Tamamo's hair returns to its normal black when she deactivates her chains, his hasn't gone back to its normal color. Ryazan? She looks around in a panic, trying to gauge the situation and how she can best explain. This this is, so, you're the Nine Tails? Turns out, she doesn't really need to. I've heard many stories of you and your kin, but turning into people is not something I've even dreamed of. Karama looks to him from the corner of his eye, gauging the man's demeanor and whether or not he'll be a threat. When Ryazan's form relaxes, so does Karama's. The fox continues to walk away. You got one thing wrong, Tamamo Atsutsuki. You haven't lost the most important thing, what matters most is still alive within you. Hagoromo's will. With that, he disappears from sight. Wait. Tamamo moves to chase after him, but Ryazan stops her. When he does, she stumbles to add falls into his arms, her exhaustion finally catching up to her. They're close behind us. I think going any further will only make things worse. Tamamo lowers her head. You're right. We should return. This time, it's Asobu's turn to be pulled into the white mental space that the tailed beasts share. His wounds are healing, but not as quickly as normal. Wounds inflicted by tailed beasts or great beasts have a way of sticking around for longer. It most likely comes from the fact they're imbued with chakra in a different way than humans are. The large turtle turns to see Karama once again in his human form, but covered in wounds and bruises. Asobu gives a light chuckle. What happened? Get caught in a hunting trap? He returns the joke. Hilarious. Karama says dryly. Cap is dealt with. Well, not dealt with dealt with, but it should be licking its wounds for a while. What made you change your mind? Asobu asks. These humans aren't as lost as I may be thought. He lets a small smile find its way on his face. I'll be going west, Asobu. We'll be far away for a while. So don't get your shell kicked again, it's embarrassing. What are you planning to do there? That's the thing. I have no idea. Back in the Atsutsuki estate, Tamamo kneels in front of a hall full of people, including her father, his most trusted advisors, his elite guards, and the Yuzumaki guests. Her father appears furious, barely able to restrain himself from breaking off the armrest of his chair. You will explain yourself and you will explain yourself at once, Tamamo. Not only did you allow the Kappa to escape, but you freed the nine-tailed fox when it was close to defeat. Father, I, disgraceful. He interrupts her. You've shamed us all in front of Lord Ryazin with your actions. The Atsutsuki name will forever be tarnished. Tamamo keeps her head lowered. I've no excuse, father. So you're unable to even provide justification for your actions. He spits out. This is what my lenience has led to. Ryazin steps forward, the clacking of his boots against the floor, focusing everyone's attention on him. You needn't defend my honor at the expense of yours, Lady Tamamo. His words draw curious looks. I shall provide Lord Atsutsuki with the answers he seeks. Lord Ryazan? The elderly man looks between the two of them in confusion. What's the meaning of this? During the battle, Lady Tamamo sensed that my mind was compromised. 
my weaker will was bent to the beast's will, and she knew full well the repercussions. Had the nine-tailed fox been taken down, it would have taken me down with it. I would have perished had it not been for her intervention. Tamamo stares at him in disbelief. Your men were about to kill me, Ryazan Uzumaki, and the one who saved my life is being reprimanded. Ryazan switches his tone to be more aggressive. If the one who saved my life is to be punished, am I to understand Lord Atsutsuki wishes for my demise? The elderly man's eyes widen in shock at the accusation. Then no. Of course not. I was. Not aware of the circumstances. The Uzumaki estate will take charge of the restoration efforts. Consider this our way of apologizing for what transpired here today. Now, if you'll excuse me, I would like to speak with my future wife. He reaches toward Tamamo, inviting her to stand to her feet. She readily takes her hand and he walks out with her in a hurry. Once outside and away from prying eyes and ears, he leans against a wall and sighs. I can't believe I just questioned the authority of an Atsutsuki branch head. He laughs despite himself. I can't speak of father, but you certainly surprised me. I'm sorry. He calms down and runs his hand over his now red hair. I did the first thing that came to mind, but it painted your friend in a negative light. She lowers her head, her expression growing somber. It seems. He does not mind things being the way they are. You didn't have to put yourself in such a position for me. Of course I did. He quickly retorts. If we're to be wed, we must stand by each other's side no matter what. So these past events have not deterred you? These past events have only made me fall madly in love. He says with a genuine smile. In merely half a day? He raises a brow. Enough time for me to see who you truly are, beyond the stories shared by drunken men. You truly are an odd one. She giggles, repeating the words that were uttered to her before. Perhaps this arrangement will be more favorable than I initially thought. I have but one condition. He stands in front of her, his previously jovial expression turning serious. I want you to tell me what you wish to do. We were connected, I saw your innermost desires. Everything you've kept bottled up for your father and for the Atsutsuki. I want you to say it all aloud to me. You demand quite a lot. I see it as the minimum. You feared your potential will be squashes and have grown to accept that. I'm telling you that's not going to happen. I will stand by your side just as I did today, Tamamo Atsutsuki. So tell me. She looks away for a moment, afraid to meet his gaze, but the memories of Huraizen Yuzumaki is flutter head once more, and she remembers she has no reason to be afraid. I wish to put an end to the threat the great beasts pose, to find a way to rid our world of them once and for all. And you believe that's possible? She chuckles and shakes his head. No, I know you believe it is. With your aid? Yes. I've never connected with someone possessing such powerful chakra, not even my cousins. Even your hair permanently changed color, and most importantly, you could see my thoughts. I wasn't supposed to? He raises a brow. No. When I connect people through my adamantine linking chains, they can see each other, but never me. You, Ryazan Yuzumaki, are more special than you may realize. Together, we definitely can stop the great beasts. I'll admit, he looks down to his hand, focusing chakra to course through it, I never really saw myself as anything other than a merchant, but the prospect is definitely enticing. Saving the world, huh? He laughs. Let's do it. If we do, however, you're going to have to get used to calling me by my new name. Her gaze lingers on him as she turns to walk further into the estate. New name? He takes her silent offers and follows after her. Tamamo Yuzumaki, of course. I think that'll be easy enough to get used to. Present day. Naruto leans back on the sofa by Hinata's side and sighs. So that's how you met. On the armchair opposite them, a second red-eyed Naruto sits cross-legged. Pretty much. Kurama answers. Like I told the brat Awaji, we parted ways long before she actually dealt with the great beasts. I was far away when all that went down. So the only source from back then that we have is useless, huh? Naruto slumped his shoulders. Well excuse me for having stuff to do. Kurama argues. It's not like I knew what she was planning to do. Wolda been there if I did. He turns his head and crosses his arms, pouting like a small child. Still, Hinata interjects, thank you for sharing such a private matter with us. She bows to the fox. I realize it must have been difficult. Yeah, this guy hates getting sentimental. Naruto laughs. Then consider this the last time. Damn brat. He huffs. Aw, oh, come on, don't be like that. Naruto continues to tease. We're buddies, right? We share with each other. Naruto. Hinata places a hand on his leg, ushering him to stop. Yeah, all right. He finally gives up. To Mamo, she sounds like she was an amazing woman. Hinata notes. She was. 
Karama agrees. She was just born into unfortunate circumstances, but came to rise above them into someone greater than even she realized. Kind of reminds me of someone else. He turns to look to Naruto. Hinata smiles and turns to him, as well. Indeed. Naruto looks between the two of them with a clueless expression. Who I mean? Karama sighs. Or maybe I'm just imagining things. With that, he dismisses the shadow clone he's inhabiting, returning his consciousness to Naruto's seal. What's he talking about? Naruto raises a brow. Hinata giggles and rests her head on his shoulder. I'm sure it was nothing. End of chapter 64